as you can see up on the screen, we're going to be looking at managing staff and volunteers uh, with a little bit of an emphasis on small charities. Um, my name's Chris, Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Heath. He's from our advice team. Hi, Heath. Hi, Chris. Now, before we start, just a quick little bit of housekeeping. I'll just make sure our cursor is away from where everyone can see it. That's no good. If you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, uh, you can try listening through your phone. Uh, if you want to do that, call the number listed in the email you, will, you would have received upon sign up and put in the access code and listen to the webinar that way. You can also ask a question at any time through the webinar by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Uh, you can do that by typing them into the, uh, into the interface, the GoToWebinar interface. Um, we have Matt who is on hand and will be typing away madly to respond to any questions you send through. We'll try and answer all the questions that come through if your question isn't answered, please feel free to send us an email uh, and we will get back to you. A recording of this webinar as well as the presentation slides will be published on the ACNC website in the coming days. We'll also send out an email uh, with some website links featured in the webinar. So don't go madly jotting everything down. Uh, you'll be able to uh, refer to your email um, and the slides when you, uh, when you get them. Finally, um, look, we really value your feedback. If you've got any suggestions for ways we can improve on our webinars, please let us know. Uh, and there'll be a short survey at the end of the webinar, uh, literally just a couple of questions. And uh, we'd appreciate it if you're able to, to fill that in for us. Okay, now that's all over the way. Let's see if we can do that. Beautiful, that's, that's a good response. What we're gonna cover today, all right, we're gonna cover four or five main themes. Um, the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll look at some general good practice tips, as well as uh, a bit of a reminder of uh, some of the other authorities, regulators and peak bodies that, uh, they have, a bit, that have a bit of an interest uh, in this space. We'll look at the groundwork your charity should lay to properly manage staff and volunteers that might take on board. That might be some processes or policies uh, or some critical thinking about how you'll effectively recruit and engage staff and volunteers. Uh, we'll also look at the induction process, which is pretty vital. Uh, then we'll also look at uh, ongoing staff and volunteer management, what your charity can do to, uh, to keep that sort of thing rolling. Finally, we'll look at what your charity should do when volunteers or staff exit, uh, aiming for some, some smooth handovers uh, and ensuring all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. So just before we start, we'll have a look at some uh, context. Uh, hey. So. The most recent Australian Charities Report found nearly half of all Australian charities operate with no paid staff, 49.6% in fact. In all, nearly 3 million volunteers support the sector through their efforts. More than 20% of those who volunteer for charities do so with religious groups, with emergency relief charities also attracting a large number of volunteers. Meanwhile, 1.3 million people are employed by charities, this represents 10.6% of the country's workforce, which is an extraordinary number. So it is clear that for many of Australia's charities, volunteers are at the center of a lot of what they do and are vital to their work. Similarly, paid staff make a huge contribution to the sector as well. Um, and if you wanna have a bit more of a look at the, uh, the Australian Charities uh, report, there's the website down there. Uh, wander on in, have a look, well worth looking at, you'll learn plenty. Um, now, when we talk about staff and volunteer management, we do need to be clear that the ACNC is not the key regulator in a number of these spaces. We're certainly interested in ensuring charities adhere to good practice in this area. And if you're a volunteer, or, and if volunteer or staff related issues are causing a charity to breach our governance standards, uh, we'll most likely become involved. But it's often the case that there are other regulators who set the tone and the law in the area. Some might be from around the, the states and the territories. Um, there's WorkSafe, there's Safe Work, uh, those types of organisations. Uh, Fair Work and the Fair Work Ombudsman, um, they're the, the federal regulators in this space. There are certain sector peak bodies which are relevant to uh, volunteering. Australia is a, is a pretty significant peak body uh, and there are various state and territory based organisations as well. Their websites and their materials are well worth seeking out and reading for further specific guidance on these topics. 
Um, as you can see there, there's some there's some links down the bottom uh, of this slide uh, to a number of those sites, and we will probably, actually, I'll say definitely, be referring back to a number of them uh, throughout throughout this webinar. One thing to note, though, is that generally speaking, volunteers are entitled to the same precautions as paid workers under work health and safety laws and under equal opportunity laws. So just because someone is a volunteer, you don't get to treat them any differently than paid staff. And to be honest, you shouldn't anyway. Treating volunteers with respect and valuing their contributions is absolutely vital. That point leads us to the first of our good practice tips here. Now, the first tip, uh, and arguably the most important, is that your charity must have a positive organisational attitude to its people. Uh, that's its volunteers and its staff. Um, treat them well is pretty much the basic. Value their contributions, respect them, make them feel welcome and include them in everything that you do. The groups I've been a part of in the past, you know, the easiest thing you can do as a charity is to simply say thanks. Say thanks publicly, thank volunteers and staff privately, even say thanks in your annual report, on your website, with a small function or get together at the end of the year. It means so much to people and helps foster a positive relationship. Our next point here, um, as you can see, it says follow the laws of the land. Now they might be federal laws, they might be state or territory regulations. There would even be some local council regulations you may need to uh, follow depending on what you're up to. Some of the sites and authorities we mentioned on the previous slide are worth referring to here. Now, as part of due diligence before you get staff or volunteers on board, your charity should ensure it can use them and it, that it actually needs them. It's no use bringing people on board if you haven't got anything for them to do. Volunteer or staff recruitment is a waste of time if there's no role for them. In addition, think carefully about whether you need to hire staff to fill a role or whether it would be better, more convenient or more appropriate to get volunteers on board. Look critically at the role or roles you are trying to fill, the responsibilities that come with them, and then think about what would be more apt, recruiting volunteers or actually employing staff. And if you are looking to employ staff, ensure you can afford to pay them properly. Indeed, indeed. Your, uh, your induction processes, they should be established before you recruit new people. Now we'll go into more detail about some of these induction processes or at least welcoming processes in a few minutes. Uh, but don't jump into recruitment without solid planning and a process which deals with uh, inducting people or welcoming people uh, into your charity. Ultimately, and this should be the overriding thought for your charity on matters like these, your people are a precious asset. They should be valued, their efforts should be recognised and they should be looked after properly. It's a mark of a good, well-run charity, no matter how big or small you are, to do this. And it ensures that your charity has a positive reputation. Now, we've got a couple of tips here before you start. You need to have a pl in place a strategy or a plan to properly manage any staff or volunteer recruitment or engagement. Again, we repeat those three short questions from the previous slide. Can we use them? Do we need them? And can we pay them? Once you've thought critically about these three quick questions and worked out some of your requirements, other questions will need to be addressed. Your recruitment strategy will be shaped by whether you need staff or volunteers, the number of people required and the task at hand. Sometimes it might be a matter of roping in some existing charity supporters for a day or two of help. Other times it might involve a proper formal recruitment process to have a new staff member come aboard. Again, choose the approach most appropriate to your needs and your abilities and capabilities as a charity. Before you get people on board, Ensure you have a clear policy or procedure which sets out their proper management. For volunteers, this could be in the form of a volunteer management policy. Not-for-profit law has some great detailed information on developing such a policy, as well as some templates to help your charity do so. If you look, if you go to that on the internet, it's nfplaw.org.au slash volunteers. Part of that policy would be clarity on role or position descriptions, including duties and tasks. This is best practice and it's just good common sense. Both charity and volunteer or staff member are then clear on what's expected and required and can clarify any points of uncertainty. Your charity will also need to have its insurance requirements sorted out too. Appropriate insurance might include public liability insurance, for example, as well as coverage that offers workplaces, that other workplaces or public events would need, sorry. 
There are some specialist charity insurers out there, and if you need further assistance, it might be worth contacting Volunteering Australia, for example, to chat about what you might need. There's a couple of links to some handy pages on the ACNC site too, one which covers engaging volunteers and the other one on employing staff. They've got some good sharp tips on the topics. Some further good practice tips here to have in, uh, have in place, uh, having your pre-engagement screening process and checks before you start. This covers po police checks, uh, working with children checks, that's uh, in Victoria, for example, or the equivalent in uh, other, other parts of Australia. Um, visas or passports, depending on what the, uh, the role might be. Uh, driver's licenses, uh, that sort of thing too. Reference checks and referee checks, uh, they fall under this process. And of course, you might well need to check someone's qualifications and education before you have them jump on board. Again, the NFP law page linked on this slide can help with many of these elements from a volunteer perspective. A number of the points on this slide are, of course, applicable whether you're recruiting staff or volunteers. Your charity should have a volunteer agreement or staff terms of employment document prepared and available for those you wish to recruit, to receive and sign off on. Again, recruitment has to comply with the law. While there can be weight given to pre-screening finding, uh, pre-screen, uh, yeah, I'll try that again. Um, when we talk about recruitment, discrimination is clearly a no-no. There are certain legal protections against discrimination on the basis of things like age, gender, uh, marital status, uh, irrelevant criminal record, uh, that sort of thing. Don't fall on the wrong side of the issue. Do the right thing. Okay. We've laid the groundwork, we're ready to go, we're getting people in, what do we do? We need an induction process. Now, the groundwork is there for a reason, and that's to ensure that your charity is in the best possible position to work through a successful recruitment process, and then once new staff or volunteers are aboard, to get them slotted into their role seamless, seamlessly, and so they can hit the ground running. And an induction process forms a critical part of this. As we state here, your charity's induction process allows volunteers and staff to hit the ground running, but more importantly, helps them reach their full potential. This includes them not being aware of the various roles and responsibilities they and others have at your organisation. This also relates back to ACNC governance standard number five, something many of you who have joined us for webinars in the past would be familiar with. This standard states that a charity's responsible persons that is, the people that are responsible for the organisation's day-to-day -day operations, must act with reasonable care and diligence. This extends to their responsibility to ensure their charity staff and volunteers are properly recruited and inducted, are managed appropriately and are made aware of the requirements of their role. A good rundown on the standard can be found at the link on the screen. So, what should be involved in your charity's induction process? We've got a little bit of a rundown here. Now, some of these items uh, might be a little bit more involved than others. If you're a very, very small charity, there may be things that you might do a little bit differently to a charity that's quite large. We're gonna give you a bit of a general background and a bit of a rundown on some of the things that you, uh, you should be considering. You should have an induction pack or, or a welcome pack ready to go. The exact contents of that pack will vary from charity to charity, depending on the individual requirements uh, that you might have. But some of the general material you are likely to need is listed here up on the screen. You'll need a position or a role description with a little bit of background material on what is required to fulfil the role. A rundown of charity policies is important. You could include your charity's, say, complaints or internal disputes policy. We'll look at those uh, issues in a little bit more detail in a few moments, as well as your policies on things like uh, conflict of interest, uh, remuneration, reimbursement of expenses, um, behavioural standards, that sort of thing. Your induction pack should include a rundown on who's who in the organisation, uh, maybe a, a rundown on some of the key charity stakeholders. You could include a copy of your annual report, uh, links to your website, all that sort of stuff. If there's any legal elements that need to be covered, induction is also the place to do that. It might be about providing information on some of these legal issues or even looking at training for the newcomer if that's appropriate. ACNC governance standards could also be part of induction. Obviously, if you're a responsible person, then this is especially relevant and important, but really this sort of information should be made available or people should be pointed to the ACNC website to anyone jumping on board. 
Some staff or charity volunteers might need access to passwords or logins. That could be to bank accounts, computer systems, the ACNC site and charity portal to do their jobs. This is part of your induction process. Now, what else do we have up here on screen? Uh, we've got the staff or volunteer agreement and terms of employment. That should be signed as part of the induction process. Um, a clear probation period should be spelled out in the agreement. While it's also suggested that um, there's a bit of a rundown on some behaviours uh, that might not be uh, might not be on, uh, behaviours that might bring about uh, dismissal uh, as a staff member or volunteer, uh, they should perhaps be clarified and spelt out as well. While an induction pack and documents can be a rather static thing, the idea of including things like a formal welcome, an office tour, that sort of stuff are just as important. We've got here, uh, say, the idea of uh, each newcomer having a mentor or a, or a buddy uh, when they jump aboard. Uh, a buddy or a mentor system combined with a good induction pack and the opportunity for any necessary training or, or learning, uh, all of these things combined, they can go a long way towards really rounding out a solid and, and useful induction process. Again, as you can see down on the bottom there, there's some links to the ACNC uh, site and to NFP Law for more information. Once you've built a solid base with the induction processes and all the proper checks, maintaining good staff and volunteer management becomes the key. There's plenty your charity and its people can do to achieve this, with one key attitude worth noting being that, that of encouraging and recognising the positive while recognising and addressing the negative. Of course, it is a very rare organisation indeed which goes through its days with no hassles, debates or disagreements. And one of the more common issues that the ACNC hears about from charities are internal disputes involving staff, volunteers, or a mix of both. Internal disputes. Now, we, Heath just said, we do get quite a few calls about this topic. Sometimes we're even asked to try and intervene or mediate in these disputes. Now, something the ACNC can't do unless the dispute poses a serious risk to public trust and confidence is, is mediate. An example where there might be a risk to public trust and confidence is if the dispute could result in a breach of the ACNC Act. Internal disputes can arise through all manner of circumstances as well. We've been told of disputes centering around social media and internet site use and abuse, around staff and volunteers not seeing eye to eye, and issues where it comes to reporting lines and responsibilities across charity staff, boards and leaders. What we do suggest is that as a first step, charities check their rules, the applicable laws or regulations, and their dispute resolution policies or procedures. Doing so is highly likely to determine how your charity will approach any internal dispute and what it will do to try and find the resolution. On that, we, we can't emphasise enough how important it is to have a, a solid dispute resolution procedure or, or process to use as a start starting point for any efforts to resolve conflicts or disagreements. There are some useful dispute resolution policy templates available at the NFP Law site, we've previously mentioned, uh, as well as through our Communities Institute for Community Directors and its policy bank. There's a link to that on the slide on your screen right now. The ACNC has some worthwhile guidance on the issue in its internal disputes fact sheet, and we've included some of it here. In short, open and respectful communication is vital as is the need to not ignore an issue and risk having it fester and get worse. Talking issues through to resolution in a way and an environment which really promotes positive steps forward is also important. That might mean a meeting overseen by a neutral mediator. Once a resolution has been reached, note it down, get buy-in from everyone involved and then commit to reviewing the progress of the resolution. Finally, there are dispute resolution services out there which may be able to help. Chris did mention that the ACNC can't do this sort Indeed. of work. Yes. But there are services out there that can help with that. If an agreement or compromise cannot be reached, you might need to use an independent mediator. Discuss who will pay for the cost, if any, of mediation before engaging the mediator, though in some states and territories there are free mediation services. You can also consider speaking with your peak body to find out more. Finally, just to note, we've got a webinar planned for July, which will look in more detail at managing charity disputes. If it's something that your charity reckons will be useful, sign up via www.acnc.gov.au slash webinars. Now, before we leave the topic of ongoing staff and volunteer management, there's a few more points to note. 
Charities can achieve significant steps forward in this area by being aware of their importance and working to get the small things right. Developing a welcoming culture at your charity and respecting and valuing people for their contributions and efforts, they're all vital. Saying thanks, as we mentioned before, is a huge part of this type of culture. It is such a simple thing to do, but it is also so often overlooked. Channels through which to access help and support, to supply or provide feedback, to just check in and gain some feedback on what you are doing, all these things are valuable as well. Your charity might decide to offer some structured opportunities to provide feedback. And of course, if you have in place an ongoing buddy or mentoring arrangement, that can help too. Finally, volunteers and staff should be given the chance to provide feedback and that feedback should be noted and if needed and where needed, acted on. Of course, volunteers and staff will eventually leave your organisation in one way or another. Again, there's some considerations for your charity when this occurs. First up, again, we say, say thanks. There's a bit of a theme running through this, as you can see, and that's to say thanks to your staff and to your volunteers. It means so much to them, and to be honest, it's just good basic manners. So do it, say thanks, write a quick note, and have a morning tea, write a thank you in their annual report, on your website, all that jazz. Importantly, staff or volunteer exit is also a chance for your charity to learn. An attitude of continuous improvement should see you aim to sit down and have a chat with anyone exiting your charity to learn and gain some feedback. An exit survey is another way of gathering information as your charity strives for this continuous improvement. Another thing that's important is tying up the loose ends, ensuring pay and documentation are up to date, as well as gathering up things like uniform or equipment they might have, as well as name tags, that sort of thing. If the person leaving your charity has access to passwords, bank account details, logins, your charity will need to have a process in place to manage this, as well as, the, as, well as being clear that the person exiting shouldn't be able to access your bank accounts <laughs> or log into your social media or the ACNC charity portal. Now, take care of these details. Um, another, uh, another issue that you need to take care of is, uh, is records uh, and record keeping. Records uh, that need to be retained, employee records, for example. Uh, now, under the Fair Work Act, organisations must keep employee records for seven years. This doesn't specifically extend to volunteer records, but as a matter of good practice, uh, organisations should keep, generally speaking, keep records for seven years. There's some good information on this, again, at the NFP Law site. Uh, that site has a great ending the volunteer relationship checklist and guide, which we will link to in our follow-up email in the days after this webinar. As you go through these processes, think about the ways you can keep these people, these volunteers or these staff members involved in your charity once they've left. Ask them if they want to stay in touch with you. Ask them if they want to receive your annual reports. Ask them if they want updates, invitations to events, regular emails. There might also be an opportunity to approach them to become a member or donor as well. Your charity should be aware of those opportunities and follow up on them if and when appropriate. Also on this slide, we've got a few further details covering a volunteer or staff member exit in acrimonious circumstances. Hopefully your charity doesn't ever have to look at these processes, but if you do, it's handy to know what you should be doing. And those three processes you can see there up on the screen, um, fairness and transparency, uh, ensure that any, uh, any meetings or any uh, processes are documented, writing, that sort of stuff, keep records, deal with unresolved complaints and issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. Handovers. Now, we're gonna hit the home stretch. We're actually making very good time here, so we might get out early for lunch. This'll be great. We're gonna have a look at handovers and some handover processes. Now, if a volunteer or staff member is moving on and a replacement is preparing to take over the role, a handover process is a must. Of course, there might be circumstances where a handover is a challenge to organise. Uh, if uh, a staff member or volunteer exits suddenly or unexpectedly, um, but where you can get a handover process organised, they are vital. The thing about them is this, you don't want any ham handover processes to result in the new arrival, uh, drowning in paper like our friend up on the screen here. Don't just throw passwords, documents, files, and that sort of thing in a, in a big pile or a big file and expect your new arrival to take everything in and take it on board immediately. Any handover process needs to be orderly, it needs to be organised and considered. Document the process, ensure you have a checklist or something to work from as you go through the handover, and that way your charity won't miss anything. 
again, establish, bud, establish a buddy or a mentoring arrangement so that there's someone ready to help out when the newcomer arrives. Of course, hand those important documents over in an orderly, ordered way. And if there's feedback about the handover process, take it on board and make changes and improvements if needed. Handovers aren't just an exchange of documents and information. They are a knowledge and wisdom exchange too. Important knowledge, institutional memory and other things can be passed on effectively through a good handover process. This is the sort of stuff you don't want to lose. Okay, some key points to remember. We've listed five key points here, not on this slide, on that slide, and we'll just quickly whip through them. Uh, now, the first one, lay the groundwork through good, to good staff and volunteer management, through policy, through planning and through preparation. Spend time preparing an informative, practical induction process. Now, ongoing staff and volunteer management occurs through planning processes and procedure and the right attitude. Aim to get things right, but plan in case something goes awry. And finally, an orderly handover process and an attitude that strives towards continuous improvement. Right, here's a list of links. Uh, that are relevant to what we've been talking about today. As we stated at the start of proceedings, there's a number of regulators with oversight in this area, as well as some good solid information on all manner of sites uh, across NFP law, um, our community, Volunteering Australia and the like. Just a reminder that a recording of this webinar, as well as the slides and other web links, will be up on the website in the coming days and contained in an email we'll send out to those who registered for this webinar. So don't bother about scribbling down all those web addresses right now. Now we've reached the end of our formal presentation. Uh, we've had some questions come through and if you want to, feel free to continue to send them through to, uh, to Matt, who's uh, busily answering them as we go. We have had one question raised, which has um, popped up both uh, as we've gone along, but also uh, we've been asked it uh, before the webinar as well. Uh, and that's the, the uh, surrounding the issue of, of uh, charities ensuring that their volunteers stay engaged and involved. Um, now, <laughs> there's a number of ways that charities can do this. We've covered a few of them uh, here. Um, what we thought we would do is perhaps um, go over some of the ways that, uh, and, and maybe repeat some of the ways that uh, charities can do this to ensure that um, they're on the right track. We've got We've got about six or eight here. So what we might do, we'll go through a few of them. We'll, uh, we'll list a couple and we'll work through that. Uh, again, the first one here is induction and in ongoing support. Um, generally, the charity that properly inducts or onboards its volunteers takes a big step towards retaining them and encouraging their uh, continued involvement in the organisation. They'll want to feel involved. They will feel involved with induction and uh, they'll want to stay involved. The second one is to make volunteers feel welcome. That's um, inviting them to events, to get them touring around the office so they know they can put names to faces, introducing them to um, your charity's leaders, uh, to other volunteers, uh, to that sort of thing. Get them helping out, you know, have, have them join you for lunch, that sort of stuff. Get them involved and, and make them feel welcome. Uh, another way is to ensure that, that volunteers have uh, and stuff have um, proper resourcing, uh, that they have what they need to do to carry out their duties uh, and carry out them in the best way in the best way possible. A lot of this can be part of information contained in the welcome pack you've uh, you've distributed to new volunteers. But if you're asking volunteers to complete certain tasks, ensure they know, say where the equipment they might need is, uh, where some items they might need, uh, what cupboard they're in, uh, where they're stored, uh, whether they'll need to supply items or, or bits and pieces themselves, or if the charity is actually covering some of that, uh, some of that stuff. Communication is vital, uh, and that involves uh, communicating to the staff or volunteer, getting feedback from them, the ability for the charity to listen, especially if and when the feedback isn't completely positive. Uh, as well as offering clear direction. Uh, ensure these people are receiving relevant and tailored information, information suited to what they're going to do. Uh, ensure, who they, ensure they know who their coordinator is, that's uh, provide a name, introduce them, shake hands, say hi, 
uh, make sure they know who their, who their coordinator is. Saying thanks, we've said it before, we'll say it again. Your charity showing appreciation for volunteers' work is among the simplest, yet often overlooked ways of keeping them engaged, happy and on board. Every charity can say thanks, and most charities will have their own unique opportunities to show appreciation. Also, as a related point, if something does go slightly skew with, work through the issue respectfully with the volunteer and behind closed doors. If there's a need later on to make any decisions public, do so in a respectful and honest way. But as a starting point, sit down privately with the volunteer and work through issues that way. Last thing is to show them the difference that they make. Ensure volunteers see their work in action through tours, presentations, and by inviting them to provide suggestions about how that work can be done better. Also, share these great stories more widely. Share them with the general public, share them throughout the organisation, invite their families around to have them in, enjoy and join in as well. Spread the word. Each individual charity, again, might have its own unique things it can do, which can encourage, encourage volunteer engagement. Have a bit of a think, a conscious think, about what your charity can specifically do or offer and how it can best do so. Chris, can I make an observation mm. on a question that sometimes comes up for us in the advice services team? Yes. So we mentioned a couple of slides back, we talked about the handover processes. Yeah. And one of the things that we've noticed some charities possibly struggle with is handing over responsibilities like reporting. I think often having volunteered in charities myself, yeah. that it's much more natural to hand over the things that we're passionate about. What I suppose in the ACNC we call the charitable purpose, yeah. the advancing of education or health, whatever the charity is there for. But it is also important to hand over the paperwork that makes that work. Yeah. For us in the ACNC, that's often lodging the submitting the annual information statement. Yes. But there are various reporting to other regulators too. That's it's something that as part of your handover process is that someone needs to have responsibility for that because it does come up for us a lot that there's been a change in responsible persons and no one was aware that they needed to report. Yeah. And what what happens if there's been a changeover in responsible persons, this handover material that's say specific to the ACNC isn't part of that process. What, what are say a couple of the very basic things that this could, that this could cause? Look, most of the time it's only an inconvenience. It just means that you get reminder letters from us and nobody wants to be in that situation. In an extreme case, it could result in the charity being revoked if they weren't submitted over a number of years. But normally, more likely, it's just that it's an inconvenience and creates stress for the parties involved. It's best for everyone if it just gets done on time. And they've got to ring us up and they've got to say, oh, we, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, can you please help us? And that yep. sort of stuff. Um, what are some of those ACNC things, uh, specific things, again, that should be part of the handover process, just as a bit of an emphasis? Well, as I said, the most important one is the annual information statement. That's yep. something that all charities registered with the ACNC need to submit to us, well, almost all charities need yeah. to submit to us. But as well as that, things like updating your responsible persons. Now, we didn't, we didn't actually mention that. If no, you we have didn't. a change in your responsible persons, you do need to update that on the ACNC register yeah. so that it can be seen who your responsible persons are. And that happens through the, uh, through the ACNC website, through the portal, uh, and uh, part of perhaps a, uh, a handover process needs to be to ensure that the right people are able to actually log in yes. <laughs> to the portal uh, because there's plenty of calls come through that people haven't got their logins. Would that be a fair thing to say? That's certainly true. Indeed. And of course, our advice services team is there to help you with this sort of thing. Indeed, indeed. Now, We've got our links up there. We've, we've covered some uh, bits and pieces there. We're going to go to there and we're going to uh, have a look at some of the ways, all the ways you can stay in touch with us. Uh, now there's ways obviously through the website. There's our advice services uh, email address right there as well, which is good. Um, we're around social media. We're on YouTube. Uh, we've got podcasts. It's all of that sort of stuff. So uh, all of those uh, links and addresses are there. Um, when you get the uh, slides in the coming days, you'll be able to refer to that information as well. Now, that's around about it. We've finished. Ooh, we've finished a little bit early, so that's not bad at all. Thanks to everyone who's come along today, uh, taken time out of their day to have a bit of a listen. Uh, hopefully we've been able to help you out a little bit. Thanks to Heath. 
thank you very much for coming along and, and helping out today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thanks for uh, helping out in the background, Matt. Uh, he is still typing away, I think. So uh, that's that's all cool. We do hope you've enjoyed our, our presentation today. We have further webinars upcoming. There's a list of them at the website there on your screen. Uh, feel free to have a look. If any of them uh, interest you, jump in, register, they're free. Um, and uh, and come along and, and enjoy uh, and join us. Any questions, any comments or feedback, um, education at acnc.gov.au. Thanks again. We look forward to you uh, joining us again in, uh, in the very near future. Have a great day. See you later.